Hallelujah. We greet you, saints, once again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Want to speak to us, saints, on the subject, live free. And we welcome the saints that are also going to join us online. We've been on the theme, free to worship, and we've subtitled it, live free, worship God, give thanks. Because in this month, we are also giving thanks all the way through to the end of the year. Live free. Can I hear somebody say, live free? In the book of Isaiah, I'll start this in Amile. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 61, the Bible is very clear about Jesus being anointed of God with the Spirit of God and Him coming on a mission that I could also term freedom, setting people free. Hallelujah. He brings good news to the poor. Praise the living God. He heals the brokenhearted. Amen. Somebody say freedom. He brings liberty to the captives. Dr. Nati, I see you. Men of God, praise the living God. Put our hands together for the good dog up there. We're cooking up some things. He's a son of this house. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Hey, actually, today there was no one playing the bass and you are here. How did that happen? Praise the living God. This man used to dance playing it by his guitar. Love. Praise God. Amen. So there's, he, he speaks here about liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound. If I look at this scripture, it clearly speaks freedom. Jesus has come to turn things around. It says he's come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the vengeance of our God, comfort to all who mourn, consolation for those who mourn in Zion, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now look at the turn around. That they may be called trees of righteousness. And we're going to speak that today. That they may be called trees of righteousness, the same who were in prison, the same who were sick, the same who were broken hearted, the same who were mourning. Here comes Jesus. He speaks freedom that turns things around. He doesn't bring fresh ones. He brings the same ones. And suddenly now they are called trees of righteousness. And then he goes on to say, the planting of the Lord that they may be glorified. Hallelujah. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Verse 4. And they shall, the same ones now, are going to rebuild ruined cities. Are you with me? They will rebuild the old ruins. They will raise up the former desolations. They will repair the ruined cities and the desolations of many generations. Hallelujah. Somebody once said, he doesn't just deliver us from almost. And they went on to say, he doesn't leave us at most. They said he takes us 
to utmost. And I'm trying to show you the divine turnaround here. From a mess to being okay. To being a channel of making things okay. Uh, do you see the freedom that is here? He doesn't just free me and leave me free. If he really frees me, woman at the, at the well, John chapter number 4. If he really frees me, he's going to pull me out of the shame, out of the mess. And he's going to make me okay. My sight will come right. My attitude will come right. I will see God for who he is. But he ain't going to leave me there. There's coming another level where I'm going to leave my water port right there and go back to the city. And when I get to the city, I am now an announcer of the one who liberates. Come see for yourself a man who told me all about me. Could this be the Christ? So be patient with yourself. Let his liberating work have its, its, its place in your life. The Bible says it is he that works in us both to will and to do. Keep saying yes to the work of the spirit, the work of the word. Keep on praying even when you feel down and disappointed and like you missed it. Don't run from God. Run to God. Keep on praising even when the enemy says you don't deserve to praise. Keep on praising because you know where life is. Where can we go from you, Lord? Because you have the words of life. That's in John chapter number 6. When Jesus was speaking hard things, they stood up and began to walk away. He turns around and says, are you guys also going to leave? I believe it's Peter that responds and says, where can we go from you, Lord? Because you have the words of life. So I'm saying praise when you are down. Praise when you are okay. Praise when you are confused. Keep going to church when you feel you messed up. Keep going to church when you feel okay. I'm talking about your neighbor. Say, hey neighbor. Uh, are you with me? Hallelujah. Keep worshiping. Keep going to the Lord. Keep on going to the Lord. Don't you dare stop entering into his presence. Because that is where your life is. That is where your change is. Life would say, when are you don't deserve to come in. But I've come to tell you today, on account of Jesus, go to him. He is the one that is anointed to turn things around in your life. He will help you break that habit, break that iniquity, break that thing that has prevailed in your family for years. So keep praying, keep worshiping, keep getting in the word, keep following the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? If you stumble, get up and keep moving again. The Bible says, do not gloat over me, my enemy, for when I fall, I shall do what I shall arise. It says a righteous man falls seven times, but seven times he arises. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Say, keep on keeping on. Say, keep allowing the work of the Lord. I'm not promoting shoddy living. I'm saying when things are shoddy and messed up in your life, you don't run from the one who can fix the mess. You keep going to him. You keep hanging around him. Uh, those who hang out with him don't remain the same. Go ask Moses. When he came down, there was glory such as they could not behold. Go ask Joshua. When he hung around, his name literally changed. Go ask Jacob. He came in a stealer. He'll catch a supplanter. He left as Israel. Go ask Jeremiah. He he came thinking I'm only a youth. He left an accurate prophet. Go ask Isaiah. He came a man of unclean lips. Living among people of unclean lips. But he left as a messenger of the Lord. Go ask Saul. He came as a persecutor of the church. But he left as a builder of the church. It was said of him, the one who was said to be killing the church, persecuting the church, is now building the church. Because when Jesus shows up, he brings a turn around. Come on, somebody shout freedom. So Jesus in Luke chapter number four says, I am the one that Isaiah was talking about. 
That's what it says. I'm the one Isaiah was talking about. I'm going to go through uh, Exodus chapter number 5 as we declare freedom to worship the Lord. Because the message in chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 9, chapter 10 is let my people go that they may worship me. God is addressing Pharaoh. He's like, let my people go. And this month we are addressing anything that has made you limp. Anything that has disturbed you in your walk with God. And here's the declaration. God says, let my people go that they may worship me. Uh, do you want me to go shopping? Uh, do you want me to go shopping? Uh, whatever it is. However long it's been there, there's a word that is, I said to the pastors, it's a decree and it's a declaration. God says, let my people go that they may worship me. Even under the sound of my voice, as I speak like this, shackles begin to break, prison doors begin to open, and there is a lifting, not in my name, but in the name of Jesus tell you something so when pharaoh heard the message let my people go that they may worship me one of his responses was the people have too much time in their hands add weights on them give them more work i gotta go past that one give give them more work load them with work. god says set them free to worship pharaoh says occupy them Hear that. Hear what God is saying to you. God says, let my people go that they may worship me. Pharaoh says, keep them busy. Give them more work. Keep them busy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? His strategy was, give them more work. Give them more tasks. It reminds me of Mary and Martha. When Jesus comes visiting their house, it was Martha that received him. Martha that welcomed him. But it was Mary that immediately set at the feet of Jesus. And it was Martha that got busy with serving. Got busy with serving. But it was Mary that sat at his feet. Listening to his words. Martha was busy for him. Mary was busy with him. So as God is calling us out to worship him. And that worship is not a song on Sunday. It's not, it's, it's not what we do in a Sunday service. It's all of our lives. It's how I treat my wife, how I treat my children, how I treat my family, how I treat the stranger, how I treat my colleagues, how I treat my boss, how I treat the company I work for, how I handle my studies, how I serve in the church. It's basically a life of worship. God says, let my people go that their relationships may worship me. <laughs> I'm going to need an amen there, Bram Fontaine. That their relationships may be a worship to me. Let my people go that their parenting may be a worship to me. Let my people go, hallelujah, that their bodies may be a worship to me. Come on, somebody, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. If we study worship holistically in the Bible, it's not limited to a slow song on a Sunday. It's all of our lives. So God says, let my people go that they may worship me. Pharaoh says, keep them busy. I want you to put a note there for yourself. What's been keeping me busy? And then Jesus, when Mary, com I mean, when Martha complains, he says, Martha, you are busy with many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary chose that part. And what she chose will not be taken away from her. Yeah. Hallelujah. So let's take our freedom to worship the Lord. Are you guys with me? Our freedom is in Christ. It comes through the word. Praise the living God. It comes through Jesus. It comes through his word. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Let's show, let's show each other that quickly in scripture. John 8, 31 to 36. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, if you abide in my word, abide where? In my word. Not visit abide if you live there so read study meditate speak live it out make it your address come on somebody say abide in his word 
says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. It's a consequence. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. You guys with me? The truth will do what? It will make you free. So truth has an assignment in our lives. It's not to puff us up. It's to make us free. When he gives you a word on a Sunday, he's addressing an area of your liberty. So go beyond excitement. I don't have time. I preached a message in Botswana. A friend of mine who was in the congregation a year later says, when you preached, I got a revelation and I started a business. Because Hebrews teaches us there's profit in the word. So others were only saying, amen, glory. She was getting a revelation that changed her economic status. Truth sets you free at many different levels. Are you guys with me? Praise the living God. They answered him. We are Abraham's descendants. We have never been in bondage. I got to pick up my pace to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So there's the liberty he's come to bring. Amen. He says, and a slave does not abide in the house forever. So slavery cuts your days short. It, it compromises your longevity, if I were to call it that. But thank God, slavery is judged in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody shout, freedom. He says, but a son abides forever. So I've come to move you from being slaves to being sons. Because sons abide forever. They are in this forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. It's clear from this portion of scripture, Jesus sets free. Amen. Jesus sets free by his word, which is his truth. Hallelujah. Okay, praise the Lord. I'll give you the notes. You'll read the others. Romans 8, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Galatians 5. I'm trying to state a case there, which is his spirit is a spirit of freedom. When you follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you will live in the freedom that God intends for you in Christ. Let me give us an example. I think it's Galatians chapter number 4. And because you are sons... God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You've just moved from slavery to sonship. Then God gives you the spirit of liberty so that in your heart he can minister sonship and eliminate slavery and a slave mentality. I don't know if you are with me. Now you cry out by the spirit, Abba, Father. He will take it further. He will say, actually, you are an heir, a joint heir with Christ. That means you've got the rights, benefits, and privileges. Are you guys still with me? Praise the living God. Are you guys with me? All right, let's take it forward. Let's speak a little bit more about freedom. I'm skipping a center there. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, there's a kind of freedom that comes with peace. But there's a kind of freedom that causes you to lose peace. While you are saying you are free, suddenly your peace disappears. There's a kind of freedom that really speaks freedom and uh, all your life is free. Praise the living God. Don't worry about that. You'll get that. Senamile will share it in the group after this. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. There's a kind of freedom that keeps you free. And yet there's also a kind of freedom, in my notes I've put it in quotes, that takes you straight back to the same bondage. Or another form of bondage. Sometimes when people are saying we are free. If you observe their freedom. Half the time it, it tends to trouble. And it's like the one who was free. In his celebration or misunderstanding of freedom. Now ends up bound again. Worse off. I don't know if you are with me. I know why I'm remembering this scripture. When you cast a spirit out of a man. It goes out. And finding no place to rest, it seeks seven others. And it comes back, finding that the place is still unoccupied, goes into the man and makes him worse than he was before. So the one who is set free 
needs to continue in that liberty and not allow it to become a liberty that then results in bondage. I need an amen there. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Uh, there, there, there are times when people exhibit outward freedom, but there remains some kind of bondage intentionally. Do you know that people who can be loud when they come into a room? Amen, my friend. My friend is nodding her head, Faith, because she's in that space and she knows that sometimes you, you are there and you are like, what are you hiding? <laughs> I don't know if you are with me. There are people who can come in outwardly, they seem to be okay. But sometimes their outward expression of freedom is actually concealing a bondage. Amen. <laughs> Amen. There's what sometimes people call public freedom, but secret bondage. You appear free, but you're still living in bondage. Biblical freedom is not necessarily doing what we want, when we want, where we want, and how we want. <laughs> Biblical freedom doesn't mean just do whatever you feel like doing, wherever you feel like doing it, with whoever you feel like doing doing it however you feel like doing it biblical freedom is not freedom without guidance amen guys i'm gonna have to ask for that amen as believers we live submitted lives in which we intentionally choose to submit to god we submit to god's word submit to his spirit we submit to biblical guidance and correction Praise the living God. Hallelujah. And all of this keeps us in the freedom that we've been freely given. Biblical freedom is not necessarily freedom of choice. That is why we don't teach follow your heart. We don't teach do you, boo. We teach what does the word say? What is the spirit of God in your heart saying? What is the peace of God witnessing in your heart? That's what we teach. We teach following God. Because there is still a scripture, the heart is deceitful above all things. There is still a scripture, guard your heart with all diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. So you can't leave it unchained and unhooked to go wherever it wants. Hey, even science has preached to you, you cannot trust your senses. Why did you do it? I felt like it. Oh, in this kingdom, we walk by faith and not by sight. And where there's faith, there is hearing from God that guides how we then walk. Can I get an amen? There's the word of God. Hallelujah. Are you guys still with me? Study those scriptures that we threw in there. Hallelujah. Biblical freedom, amen, is freedom through transformation. It's, it's an outflow of a transformed life. Did you hear what I said? It's not freedom of choice, but it's freedom that's a result of a Christ-orchestrated transformation in your life that sets you free in every space. Oh my goodness. Biblical freedom will make you free in your body. Will make you free in your soul. You will prosper in your soul. Will make you free in your spirit. Will make you free with your surroundings. Free towards other people. Free in the way that you live your life. Last week we spoke online and in Centurion on the subject uh, practicing faith in God. Or rather, we spoke on the freedom that comes through practicing your faith in God. When you live by faith, you will be free. And others around you will be freed by your life of faith. James says, faith without works is no good, is useless, is dead. It changes nothing. So there are works that flow out of the freedom that is in Christ. That will cause you to live free. And everyone else around you will experience the liberty you live in. Jesus impacted the disciples. They were set free in different ways. And the liberty they received caused them to be liberators wherever they went. 
One time he sent them out and they came to him and said, and said to him, even demons are subject to us in your name. She was like, yeah. I saw Satan fall like lightning. One of my favorite scriptures. I saw Satan fall like lightning. He says, I've given you the power. The same ones he came for, Isaiah 61, Luke 4, have experienced transformation. And now they are living from that transformation. And wherever they go, there's freedom in their families. Freedom among their friends. Freedom among their colleagues. Freedom for creation. Did you know that creation longs for the same glorious liberty of the sons of God? There are things in creation when Jesus comes and things in creation in the present day that are saying, I want the freedom that the believers, the sons of God, have. Praise the living God. I don't know what space you operate in. So biblical freedom is a result of a total, full reliance of faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. That makes it possible for us to stand before God, fully accepted as his own now and also at the coming of Jesus. Praise God. All right, let's move forward and break it down a bit. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Let's work together to get through this. I'll do just one version, though I wanted to do more. Galatians 5, verse number 1 to 13 should be possibly my next slide there. It says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Amen. And it says, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It says, stand fast. Another version, the NIV would say, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Paul is emphasizing, stay in the freedom that Christ has freed you for. The Apostle Paul says, I press towards them. I press so that I may attain that for which Christ attained me for. So I've been set free for freedom. And he says, stay in that freedom. Don't lose that freedom. What does he say next? He says, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Can I remind somebody that this is the same Jesus that says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. He says, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my burden for for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and you will find rest for your souls so jesus came in a situation of of mankind being yoked mankind being burdened mankind trying to be right with god and in all of our attempts we fell short for if you kept nine of the commandments and you missed one, you were as guilty as the one who didn't even start. Are you guys with me? So Jesus comes, he finds us heavily burdened and heavily yoked. And when he shows up, he says, take my yoke upon you. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So take off the one you've been wearing. That's what the Apostle Paul is fighting for here. Take that former yoke off. Put on the one of Christ. He says you will find rest for your souls. Let's read together. Verse 2. Indeed, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. These things will, sh sh should concern us. I'm going to come back to that. If you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Verse 3. And again I testify to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the law, the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. This is the biblical falling from grace. Not the one year band. Somebody backslides and they say he fell from grace. The biblical falling from grace is this one. It's setting aside what Christ has done. And going back to the former to try and be made right through your own effort or through the works or the demands of the law. Are you guys still with me? Praise the living God. He says in verse number five, for we through the spirit eagerly await for the hope of righteousness by faith. I'm going to come back to that. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. It's like in Christ, the circumcised and the uncircumcised, kefanan, it avails nothing. Hallelujah. But faith working through love. Here's what avails in Christ. Faith working through love. Can I hear somebody say faith working through love? He says, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? It's as if Paul is troubled about his spiritual children here. Because he taught them the right way. But others have come to trouble them. And, and, and to, if you like, have come to drag them back to the former. That's what he's contending for here when he says, stay free. Don't go back to bondage. Are you guys still with me? You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? He says, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. It doesn't come from God who calls you. Listen to this. He says, a little leaven leavens up the whole lump. A little leaven leavens up the whole lump. Whichever way you say it, leaven, leaven. Amen. Depends what school you went to. Praise the living God. A little leaven leavens up the whole lump. Yeast. You put just a bit, but it affects the whole dough. He's trying to say, a little bit of mixing things up will mess up the whole thing for you. A little bit of God confidence and a little bit of self-confidence will mess the whole thing up. A little bit of the finished work of Jesus and a little bit of your own works will mess the whole thing up. There was a group that troubled Israel as they were moving from Egypt to the promised land. They were called the mixed multitude. They were a bit of them and a bit of nations that are not them. There are things that troubled Israel on their way from Egypt to the promised land. And some of the things were remembrance of the former. While they are being led by God through the wilderness, drinking water from a rock, eating food, they could only name, what's this? Manna. Shoes growing on their feet. Clothes not growing old on them. Whatever they were wearing. Suddenly they remembered the onions and the garlics of Egypt. God is pulling you to your own land. But the farmer is calling your name. This is a very, very huge theme in scripture by the way. And you got to get a hold of it as a child of God. Because it's pointing to the same message. Lord and his wife being taken out of the Sodom and Gomorrah that's been judged. Keep walking. Don't you dare look back. Because when you look back, you become a pillar of salt. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. So scripture would say, forget the former things. When Paul says, leaving those things that are behind. He's not just talking about a bad experience, a friend who betrayed you, what, what, what. He's talking about leaving the dictates of the former covenant behind. And pressing forth to the dictates of the new covenant. Philippians 3, if you are writing. That's why he will give you his CV, his profile, according to the former. And then he will say, but whatever things were gained to me, whatever things were, gave me prominence, he says, I have counted them as rubbish. Other versions take it further. They say, I count them as dung. You know that thing that's at the crawl? Count them as dung so that I may get a hold of that which Christ has brought for me. He's trying to say, I have to count my self-effort, my righteousness according to the law, my works to attain. I've got to count them as absolute rubbish so that I can get a hold of the righteousness in God that Christ has brought for me. Oh, Bramfontein, I thought I was going to let us go at half past, but you guys look like you want us to dig deeper. I'm looking for that, it's obvious, look on your faces. 
But I'm busy getting a questioning look. What do you mean? What do you mean? No, I mean, I didn't come here. I'm not loyal to my notes. I'm loyal to ministry to you. So we've got to let go of the former. The son of the bond woman, Ishmael, must go with the woman of your effort, Hagar. They must go. Let them cry out to the Lord in the wilderness, but they must go. Because the son of promise and the son of the bond woman cannot live in the same house. So God says something difficult to Abraham. Abraham comes when Sarah is saying, let this woman and her child go. The man is in a dilemma. He goes to God and he says, what shall I do? And God says, your wife is right. She led you into this mess, but she's right. The son of the bond woman cannot live in the same space as the son of promise. One mountain, you cannot live on two mountains. You have to live one and live in another. You can hold on to both. What we've come to do here today as we declare live free, we've come to turn the cup right side up. Upside up. Right side up. That's English. Praise the living God. Upside up. We've come to turn the cup around. Right side up. So that we may get a full hold of what he's given to us. Are you guys still with me? So he says in verse 10, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment. He's like, I know you are starting to believe wrong. Because someone is troubling you with a foreign teaching. This is the same Paul who says, if I or another come preaching a different gospel. He's like, there's only one gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hold on to that gospel of Jesus Christ. If somebody else comes teaching you to do it by your works. Do it by your effort. Do it by your whatsoever. They're teaching you something wrong. In fact, Paul says, let that man be accursed. A passionate man was teaching and preaching in the book of Acts. His name is Apollos. He was a passionate guy. He was on fire. But he was zealous with a worldview of the former. With a view of the former. So, Priscilla and Aquila had to sit him down and teach him about Jesus. Come on, somebody say, Lord, teach me about Jesus. So that he would not just be passionate, he would be, he would be passionate on the right foundation. He says, I as a master builder laid the foundation, 1 Corinthians 3. He says, and another builds on it. And he says, but take heed. How you build on this foundation. Because no other foundation can any man lay except that which is already laid. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. The same way you got born again is the same way you continue living as a believer. Is the same way you will find yourself declared right before God. It's through no effort of yours. It is through the finished work of Jesus. And it is through your faith in Jesus. And I want to put a big word there. Alone. It's through Jesus' work. Alone. And faith in Jesus. Alone. I know life teaches us, no, you, you got to earn it in faith. You got to earn it. Everything you've wanted in life, they're like, you got to earn it. You got to earn it. I've come to preach the good news. Good news here is you can't earn what's already been earned for you. In fact, with all your budget, you couldn't afford what's been earned for us in Jesus Christ. Are you guys with me, saints? Verse number 11. He says, and I, brethren... If I still preach circumcision, if I still preach the former, if I still preach you being made right according to fulfilling what the law dictates, eh? 
Circumcision is one of the things that flew, that came out of that. Are you with me? If I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? The man is saying I'm being persecuted because I'm preaching what's different. Say amen. amen. Then the offense of the cross has ceased. He's saying the cross has come to uh, offend things. It's come to offend your performance. It's come to offend, are you hearing what I'm saying? It's come to offend all of those things because it strips you of all of those things and it says glory in nothing but Jesus only. You guys still with me? Verse number 12. It says, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. I wish that those who bring something different would just separate themselves. That's what he's saying. Are you guys with me? Verse 14, 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. What have we been called to? We've been called to freedom, to liberty. Come on, somebody say, I've been called to liberty. And then he says, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, this liberty comes with responsibility. It's not come to indulge the flesh, lest you find yourself bound again. And in flesh, I'm addressing self-confidence. In flesh, I'm also addressing uh, the works of the flesh. That the same Galatians chapter number 5 will then speak about. The works of the flesh are, I don't know if you are with me. It says, don't use it as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he frees us to be a blessing to one another. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. I'm going to race through this, try to do this in maybe 10 minutes. Praise God. Then we'll pray. But my notes are comprehensive and they'll be in the Bramfontein News group this afternoon. Senamile. We'll post them now or later. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So according to the word of God, we are free from righteousness through circumcision. You saw that. We read the scripture, right? Hallelujah. According to the word of God, we are freed from righteousness that comes only through circumcision. We don't need to add anything to Jesus. You don't need to anything. And the message is consistent. Elijah took the prophets of Baal to the mountain to prove who the real God is. He says, put the, put, put the sacrifice or he repaired the altar, put the sacrifice on. Then he said, put no fire under it. And we are here to, to reveal God. So don't assist it. Don't assist it. Because if you assist it, you will think it was you. Put no fire. The call here. Is to us receiving this abundant grace and the free gift of righteousness so much that even those who know us will say, we know Temba. He couldn't have. But that's a good testimony that says, but look what the Lord has done even through him. Not a testimony that says, yeah, you see people like what Temba are serious. And then the listener starts thinking he's getting that because he's serious. Now the testimony must be pure. Look at the wonders of Jesus. Look at the finished work of Jesus. Only Jesus could have done this in his life or in her life. Can I hear somebody say, Amen. Amen. So freedom from righteousness through circumcision, which was a mark also of the covenant they had with God in the former. Are you guys with me? Hallelujah. Freedom from righteousness through the law of Moses. Freedom from the righteousness that comes through doing A, B, C, D to 10. That's not what makes you right in Christ. I need you guys to hear me. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm going to have to finish this. God help me. Amen. Freedom from end or achieved righteousness. You know, end righteousness, you worked for it. Today, I invite you to join me in the book of Romans, chapter number three. You can start in three. And go all the way to chapter 8 to understand what I'm preaching today. 
I also invite you to read the whole book of Galatians to get a hold of what we are teaching today. And then you will see traces of the same message in all the other letters. Praise the living God. You got that. Amen. Freedom from righteousness that is achieved through a, a, a man that is earned or achieved. In fact, God says man's righteousness uh, is as a filthy rag. Scripture likens it to that. At best, when a man tries to be righteous, his righteousness is like a filthy rag. Dirty cloth. I need an amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are being freed to justification that comes by faith in Jesus alone. Faith in Jesus alone. Faith in the finished work of Jesus alone. Not justification by works. The message I'm preaching is God doesn't accept you because of your performance. God receives you and I because of what he's done for us in Jesus. Amen. And Galatians chapter number 6 Verse 11 to 15, take us there, uh, Sanamila, if you can. Um, I'm going to need your scriptures. It says, see with what, with what large letters I have written to you in my own hand. The man is saying the same thing over and over again. He's like, I'm, I've written with large letters. Take us back. Amen. I've written to you with large letters. He says, I've written to you. He says, with my own hand. In other words, I want you to get this and not doubt that it's what I'm saying. Let's go on. Verse 12. He says, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised. Only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. He's trying to say they are going for the easy. Seemingly. Amen. Verse 13. For not even those who are circumcised keep the whole law. He's saying they are preaching to you something they are failing every day to keep. Are you seeing that? But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. They are self-centered in their teaching. Verse 14. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's like, if you celebrate anything, if you are confident of anything, if you expect anything, if you hope for anything, it's got to be for, for this one reason, the cross of Jesus Christ. Favor is just waiting to manifest in your life. But favor might not manifest as long as you think it's a bit of you. There is a raw favor, unreasonable favor, crazy favor. I saw something in the service today. I even held my hand. My head during the worship because I was like, I don't even know how to explain this. Crazy favor that's hanging over us. But that favor cannot sit on you. You're still holding on to Isaac and Ishmael. A bit of you and a bit of... Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? I will not boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Verse 15 is probably the last one there. Amen. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. In Christ Jesus, only the new creation avails. Hallelujah. So free from our own labor. Amen. Free to embrace everything that Christ has given to us. Please allow me just a bit of time to complete this. Amen. Hallelujah. We've been freed for righteousness before God. But it's not a righteousness we've attained. It's a righteousness we've been given. Are you guys with me? We've been freed so that we can enjoy God. Now there is a scripture, Hebrews 4.16 Therefore, come boldly into the throne room of grace to obtain mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Now there's a come boldly, not on your account, on account of Jesus. It's Jesus, it's through the death of Jesus on that cross that that veil was torn 
from the top to the bottom. It was not because of how serious you are. It was not because of your performance. It was an act of God. That's why it had to be torn from the top to the bottom. God was saying, I have made a way you could not make for you to come and enjoy me and enjoy fellowship with me. For you to come to the light. For you to come to the most holy place. Which others under the law died if they stepped into. And they didn't have their T's crossed and their I's dotted. But now he says in Christ. He, says, he doesn't just say come. He says come boldly. Because now you glory in the cross. Your confidence is in Jesus. Oh, you got to get me right here. This doesn't lead to dysfunction. This leads to living life in righteousness and holiness. This leads to transformation that speaks freedom in all areas of your life. The habits that held you for a long time, when you receive the abundance of grace, they will be annihilated and become as if you, you will even wonder what was going on. You know, when you come to a place where you're like, I can't believe I used to do that. <laughs> then you know, he knows how to walk into a temple. That's a mess. Prepare, weep, and clean it up. Oh, I love preaching from John 2. Because there, he's, he explicitly says, destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. They were like, this temple took years to build by our fathers. He was not talking about that temple. He was talking about the temple that's sitting here today. And Jesus, as he symbolically walked into that temple, I've come to tell you, is zealous for the house of the Lord that's sitting here. And he knows how to clean up in my thoughts, clean up in my emotions, clean up in my character, clean up in... Uh, are you hearing what I'm saying? He knows how to clean up every part of our lives. So there's a scripture, I quoted it last week. It's in the book of Zechariah. It says, open up your doors, Lebanon, and let the fire... Just open your doors. Stop blocking with your self-effort and self-confidence and self-trial. Just open up your doors and let the fire come in. They will say he was blind. Now he can see. He couldn't walk. Now he can walk. She was getting water by herself. Now she's evangelizing a whole city. Just open up. Receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And watch things change. So we are freed to, to enjoy God, to know God, and to fully belong to God. We are freed to fellowship with God who is holy. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? You know what scripture says? We are freed now to go and fellowship with God. Hallelujah. We are free to enjoy finally and fully what we were created for. We are free now. We even have future hope of righteousness. I've got to explain that one. I said I was, I was going to come back to it. Now Paul throws into the future. Go check out John chapter number 6 again where Jesus throws things into the future. When he says hope here, he's not saying that I hope he comes. He's talking about confident, solid hope about the future. He's saying we have this hope. That when we appear before God, on account of his own work, he will declare us righteous, not guilty, holy. But I've come to tell you, Jesus has done all the work that needed to be done. Begin with accepting what he has done. And then you will watch the things you were praying would change in your life. Begin to change as you focus on Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. We with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. We're not 
busy beholding our lives. We are not busy beholding our performance. We are not busy putting confidence in what we could do. We are placing our confidence in the finished work of Jesus. In what God has done for us. And on account of what God has done for us. People like well, Paul can say I'm innocent of the blood of men. You can come when I and say, well, now you did this and you did that. The man says, then Jesus came. And I put my confidence in him. And on account of what Jesus has done, God now declares me not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Are you guys with me? So in future, I love that. I love John chapter number 6 because there's a sense of Jesus there talking about how he will present us right before God. There's a sense in which you work to present yourself. And I'm going to tell you, you will fall short. Because before you even walk out of here, you might have been offended by someone. So if you are trying to attain it on your own accord, you will fall short. But on account of the finished work of Jesus, he declares you no guilty. Some say his grace is scandalous. They say it's scandalous because when the devil is busy counting against you in a boxing ring, I saw something happen to a famous boxer and I was like, oh my. Are you with me? When the devil is counting against you and it's like at number three, they are going to declare you've lost. Grace kicks in and says four, five. And your enemies are like, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's unfair, that's unfair. Uh, how long are we going to count? And Grace is like, until she gets up, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hallelujah. I asked you to let me finish. Two more slides and we are done. So we are free now to defend this freedom that we have in Christ. You got to defend it from yourself. You have to defend it from others. You got to defend it from things. Then I have to study my notes and read. Praise the living God. I might just even share a nice message that might, that might help us on the subject. Are you with me? Freedom to defend this thing. Now you must stand in Christ and Christ alone. In the finished work of Jesus alone. In faith in Christ alone. God would say to Paul, my grace is sufficient. In other words, it needs nothing else. You don't need to add anything to support or to help. Uzzah died trying to support the ark. It needs no support. It needs you to master receiving what he has done. As you receive what he has done, Paul teaches us in Romans chapter number 5, they that receive, that's what you must concern yourself with. They that receive, help me God, receive this free gift of righteousness. Number two, help me God to receive this abundance of grace. He says those will reign. In life, in other words, if you truly embrace what I'm preaching about the right way, it will not make you dysfunction. I'm just falling and getting up. Ah, oh, there's under grace. Ah, oh, it's only Jesus. Oh, I'm saying if you allow the fire of the Lord to come in, the finished work of Jesus to come in, it will change your step, man. It will square up your shoulders. It will change the way that you think. It will give you confidence where you had no confidence, not in yourself. But in Jesus. Do you guys get an idea of what I'm talking about? Yes. Hallelujah. So please do go spend time with those scriptures that have, that have placed there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. This freedom frees us with one another. It frees us to enjoy a love feast with other believers. <laughs> free people are able to be free towards others. So this freedom that is in Christ liberates us. Because I realize you and I have been baptized into the body by the Lord. I realize you're my brother. You're my sister. Some say blood is thicker. Yeah, blood is thicker. Especially the one that was shed on the cross. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? It frees me to love you. Frees me to serve you. Frees me to pray for you. Frees me to speak right about you. Frees me to meet your need if there's a need. It frees me to be your true brother and sister. Won't you look around and say, hey brother, hey sister, hey my brother, hey my sister. Tell those who are visiting, it's not always him preaching. We don't do this every Sunday. <laughs> Praise the living God. Are you guys, are you guys hearing what I'm saying? It frees us. I'm going to say this again. There's one thing that we need to recover in the kingdom. It's the God kind of love towards each other. And we need to get rid of the corruption of love, if love could ever be corrupted. We've allowed the world to dictate what love is. Sometimes even believers in there are thinking, I like the world. You see a guy walking with a lady, you are like, ah. And you think you are seeing a vision or a revelation. No. To the pure, all things are pure. So to the corrupt, all things are corrupted. Here, we are first and foremost brothers and sisters. If she says she loves you, she means with the love of the Lord. If he says he loves you, he means with the love of the Lord. If the agenda ever changes, he will pray. Precious says my office or Pastor Zuma's office. He will pray. He will seek the Lord. He will not come while it's just feelings. He will come when he's got resolve. Say, hey, my sister, man. Yes, you are truly my sister. <laughs> but you know what? I'm hearing another matter now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And you have full rights to say, I see this vision. I am born in me. <laughs> Praise the living God. Are you guys with me? A love feast. We've got to get rid of this cold approach to doing church. You don't know who he is, who she is, who she is, who he is. You don't know where they come from. You don't know if they've been fed. You don't know if they are okay. You don't know if they need prayer. But you go to the same church. I heard that. Mm. It's usually a repentance point. Praise the Lord. I'm done. Praise the living God. And further, I speak about freedom together. Freedom together. Which now is this freedom causes us to unite with one another. When they say we are praying, we, I'm part of the we that is praying. I need an amen here. I'm wrapping up. I become part of the we that is praying because I didn't baptize myself into the body. I was placed by God in the body. So I've got to respect the body. If we are giving, I'm part of the we that's giving. If we are fasting, I'm part of the we that's fasting. If we are evangelizing, I'm part of the we that's evangelizing. Come on, somebody talk to me here today. Turn to your neighbor, say you are part of the we. <laughs> it doesn't sound right. Amen. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the living God. Let me, it's necessary for me to wrap it up with the scripture, Romans 5, Romans 6, 15, lest you misunderstand me. Romans 5, 16, if you can throw it up. Amen. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? The man says, certainly not. If you think this is a license, to go and mess around, you've missed the point. Go study it again and again and again and again. When he frees you, he says, go your way and sin no more. Go your way and sin no more. Are you guys with me? Praise the living God. It is for freedom that Christ has made us free. So live free. Starting with right believing. So that you can live right. If you believe wrong, the living is not going to come right. Because the living right is not possible on your own effort. The living right is a result of the transformation that comes through being lavished with God's love. Lavished with God's grace. God going to every extreme. Amen. To make us right with Him. And out of that place, having been made right... Now I'm able to worship God. You are holy 
And as I'm busy beholding him, singing, you are holy. Guess what's happening to me? Transformation into the very same image. As I keep looking at him, I become just. And people are going to say, Los is lawyer. Yo, Bevan Swim, lawyer. Yo, Machita Bapeli. And they'll say the same one is preaching the gospel. The same one is moving in the power of God. You guys, that's the statement in Funagus accept. That guy. How you are, how, Praise the Lord. <laughs> 